So thank you again, Dr. Smith, for coming. Uh, for anyone who is unaware, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to you, um, uh, sir. So just in case people don't know how uh, prestigious it is that we have you here. Uh, Dr. Dale Smith, he's a professor of military medicine and history in the Department of Military and, Emer and Emergency Medicine at Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences um, School of Medicine. Um, you received your PhD uh, in the history of medicine from the University of Minnesota and then moved to Uniformed Services University in 1982. Uh, you've authored numerous papers as well as um, published books as well um, from William Budd's essay on the causes of fever as well as glimpsing modernity, military medicine in World War I, which came out in 2015. And you are also editing a, a book that will come out soon or recently came out, The Fundamentals of Military Medicine. Uh, you have received numerous awards as well from uh, the Lawrence D. Redway Award for Excellence in Medical Writing, as well as honored by USU um, with the University Medal for your commitment to the academic life of the university, as well as uh, teaching awards from the medical students, uh, such as the Outstanding Civilian Educator Award. Uh, so thank you so much for being here and for recording uh, the video that we hopefully everyone on this call has watched. Um, I watched it a couple of times actually. Uh, so first I wanted to give you the opportunity if you had anything to add um, or comment, which is fine if you don't, um, happy to just open it up to questions as well. But if Dr. Smith, you had anything you wanted to add, please um, feel free to, to take it, take the microphone. I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to continue to teach. Uh, I have been able to teach a few members of the Navy Medical Corps over the last 40 years as they've come through USIS or in other formats. Uh, I was in some ways brought to uh, provide a, a Navy and Marine Corps dimension to the USIS history program because it was started by a retired Army colonel and uh, he thought of military history as being army history. And uh, so I've, I've been privileged to carry the Navy torch for these years. Uh, now I, I get to do everything, but uh, I am pleased to uh, have what may be my last formal lecture um, be a Navy lecture. So uh, I will retire this summer. I don't know what I will be doing in terms of teaching after that. But uh, if this is the last one, I am uh, glad to have the opportunity to, to make it for the Navy Medical Corps and their birthday. So with that, I will turn it back to you to uh, field questions or discussion if there is some, and uh, we'll see what people have to say. Over. Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. and. Um, we are honored to, to have you give your last lecture uh, for the medical corps. So thank you again. Uh, I will open it up for questions or just discussions. Uh, if you would like to just uh, unmute yourself, you can. You can also raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, so any questions or comments from the audience? Or actually, I, I can start out. Um, I had a question from the lecture. I, I, um, I noticed that at one point, uh, we got Navy Medical Corps had expanded into subspecialties. I believe it was um, kind of the as change, like when people were getting more health insurance. And you had mentioned that uh, a lot of the subspecialists had come from the reservists or joining in the reserves. When did that shift? Or if I'm if I'm interpreting that incorrectly, please correct me. Um, but when did it shift from kind of more subspecialists? in the reservists to active duty. Over. Sorry. The Navy recognized uh, in the 1930s that specialization was the future. And so they established some specialties. They established uh, field medicine for people that went down to Quantico and played Marine. Uh, they established submarine medicine for people that went up to Groton and were willing to get on um, those early boats that were basically U-boat uh, 
technology that had been imported uh, after we won the First World War, um, and they had flight medicine. And they recognized that surgery was a specialty, but they didn't want a specialty of surgery because in time of war, all Navy doctors needed to be able to do some level of trauma care. Reservists came in during the Second World War, bringing board certification with them. And after the war, that was quickly accepted as an American standard, uh, largely because um, if you got sick or hurt during the war, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, you would see somebody forward. But since they had very little holding capacity, and you were just cluttering up the fighting strength on whatever platform, you were sent back to some sort of hospital, even for what we would think of as something that you could take care of in quarters now. And so soldiers got the impression, sailors got the impression that uh, specialist medicine was the best medicine. And so when they went home, uh, and about 8% of Americans, mostly young males, who would become heads of households uh, in the 50s, uh, went home and the VA gave them a loan to move into a subdivision and the Hill-Burton uh, Hospital Act would build a, a hospital in their suburb. Uh, they wanted specialists. The people on active duty or draftees in the 50s also wanted specialists. So the Navy started training specialists. Uh, they'd been doing some of it without certification, but they now let people take boards. Um, after 1960, it became clear that everybody was a specialist. The class that graduated in the spring of 1960 nationwide, 99% of the people entered residency. So specialization had arrived. It was the, the appropriate standard. If you were a GMO, um, you could still be licensed, but uh, you really weren't a physician or surgeon yet. And so you needed to go and finish under the doctor draft, uh, you could come in as a GMO uh, after internship, do two years and go back to civil life. Or you could come in uh, under the Barry plan, having gotten your specialization, you would then come in as an 04 rather than as an 03, uh, which has some advantages. Um, and you would be in a hospital, which also has some advantages if you like clean sheets and you know meals that aren't served by Filipinos uh, between rolling seas in North Atlantic. Um, the challenge uh, was that as the Navy was catching up in the 60s, civilian society was moving to subspecialization. And so beginning uh, very quickly, uh, they began to look for subspecialization in the reserves. And that's what we went to Vietnam with in the mid 60s was reserve subspecialist vascular surgeons and so on. But recognizing they were useful in far forward hospitals like Vietnam, the larger naval hospitals began to train subspecialties in the late 60s. And by the 70s, uh, subspecialty training was increasingly common. It was seen as a recruiting tool. You would go on active duty uh, and get specialty training and you get an active duty service obligation. So then you went out to the fleet to repay your active duty service obligation. And then you came back for your fellowship to get your subspecialty training and you incurred another uh, active duty service obligation. And then you would go back to the fleet to pay that off and they would offer you a job uh, as a, an assistant program director or something that was intellectually stimulating. And uh, it worked out as a very successful way to keep people on active duty to get to 12 years. It turned out that by the late 70s, if you could keep somebody on active duty for 12 years of creditable time, then they would stay for 20 because that was just two more PCSs and they'd get a retirement. And so it subspecialty training was partly a recruitment and retention tool and partly meeting a standard of care. Uh, with the all volunteer force, uh, it became necessary to find a different way of keeping people on active duty and a specialty differential propay that you still live with for signing a contract for an extended period of time and you get more money uh, became the way we, we recruited people. And subspecialty medicine is, is the standard of care for the last 50 years over. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. That was a, a great answer. Um, it kind of uh, shows how, how things have shifted over the years, for sure, or over the decades, I should say. Um, I did want to open it up to the group to see if anyone else had any questions. Um, I do have another question, but I want to hold off in case anyone else has any. Please feel free to either just unmute yourself or um, you can also raise your hand either way. I'm also just admitting some people to the to the group now. All right, well, as everyone keeps uh, thinking of their questions right now, um, do you think that, uh, well, actually you kind of answered this question. So, so do you think that it was really that the civilian care, as you said before, the civilian care kind of advanced more and that, that shaped the way that military medicine, or do you think that military medicine um, shaped civilian care more over the last, I don't know, 70 years or so? <laughs> I think military medicine has shaped trauma and trauma management. And since the 1970s, has at least played a parity role in infectious disease. Because by the late 60s, most of the childhood diseases were getting immunizations. And it was only the military that went places that you could catch an infectious disease. American medicine was shifting more and more to chronic disease management, diabetes, uh, arthritis, heart disease. Um, their civilian medicine dominated, I mean, NIH is considerably bigger than the Navy Medical Research Center. Um, and so they were the they were the driving force for much of scientific change uh, in the the period since the 60s and 70s, uh, with the exceptions of ID and trauma surgery. Um, now, that doesn't mean that military medicine hasn't uh, had an impact. Uh, vascular surgery uh, was vastly helped by uh, vascular trauma repair. Uh, much of modern venous surgery uh, is a direct result of the work of Kerstein and Rich uh, in the 60s in Vietnam trying to improve uh, vascular return in uh, vascular injuries to the extremities. The infectious disease people needed platforms and so a lot of modern cell culture came out of John Sell's work at the Institute of Medical Research here on Bethesda Naval Base. And then uh, Commander Sell was recruited to NIH and uh, spent the last 25 years of his career uh, running cell culture at NIH. But it started uh, back in these World War II laboratories on the far side of Bethesda Naval Hospital, uh, now Naval Support Activity Bethesda. I still want to call it the National Naval Medical Center, but that's just because I recent memory is frail and old men, but it's uh, it's been a a synergy. Uh, then in the eighties, because of congressional arguments over how we were going to divide the budget between national security and domestic concerns, military medicine moved into managing university research under congressionally mandated programs. The first one was breast cancer. Many people felt like there wasn't enough breast cancer research left in the Reagan budgets at NIH. And so they put hundreds of millions of dollars into military medical research to study breast cancer, which was, of course, not a military medical problem at all. But the people up at Fort Detrick, where congressionally mandated research programs were, were operated, did such a good job that Congress kept sending money uh, to really non-military problems uh, into that environment until 2005 with the BRAC, people began to ask, you know, is this sensible? We're paying for two large research management infrastructures, one in Bethesda and one in Frederick. Can't we combine them and put the money back in NIH? Well, most of it went back, but we still have some congressionally mandated research programs, particularly around neuroscience, regeneration, and psychiatry, because the wars of the last 15 years have made those more pressing military problems. We would desperately like to be able to regrow limbs 
rather than just replace them with prosthesis. Uh, so uh, the NICO and places like that are uh, getting some, some research money. Over. Wonderful. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, yeah, regrowing limbs would be uh, phenomenal if we could do that. <laughs> so um, does anyone else have any questions? Hey, this is uh, Captain Anthony Keller. First of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. I still remember your lectures from my MS1, MS2 year. And, and if I can date myself, us here, um, you had these, um, these old carousels with the slides. And I still remember you were showing a, a lecture and one of your slides came up upside down. It was an aircraft carrier that was sitting there on an ocean above. And um, uh, and I just remember you deadpanned. You said, that's not the typical configuration for an aircraft carrier as you moved on. Uh, so uh, anyway, hey, I had a question about uh, graduate medical education. We've really seen, and you, you kind of danced uh, around this a little bit uh, with your prior comment uh, that since the 1960s, 99% um, of medical school graduates go to a, a training program. But wondering, uh, we've in your time, we've seen the expansion of a lot of residency programs in the military. Can you kind of talk about how um, military graduate medical education has developed and, and what percentage, uh, to your knowledge, of graduate medical education in the United States is military? Over. The military accession class uh, is about 1,200 of uh, a little over 13,000 uh, medical graduates every year. So it's 9% of uh, the, uh, the average annual medical uh, community. Most of the HPSPs, uh, which is 85% of the uh, entering class, uh, will train in civilian residencies and defer their active duty. That is because uh, Congress continues to modify the rules at random intervals over whether you acquire active duty obligation for residency and whether it can pay back obligation you already have and whether it counts for retirement. I mean, all of these kind of things go into factoring a career. So as, as that tinkering changes, um, probably 20 to 25% of the people coming in, call it 250 people, uh, enter uh, PGY-1 and go through a, a military system. Uh, can the country survive without that? Well, sure. Um, can the military survive without that? That's less clear. Um, getting the right mix of people that are going to practice essential skills in the military um, that are highly re repaid in the civilian world, uh, some of them in imaging, some of them in neuroscience, uh, many of them in subspecialties in surgery. Um, this, is a, this is a matter of important active duty service obligation analysis in the G1 shops. And uh, the challenge is you, you can't really do neurosurgery without pediatric cases. Uh, you can't do vascular surgery without pediatric cases. Um, you can't do imaging without small bodies as well as large bodies. And residencies require a geriatric and a uh, pathology mix so that you can't do general surgery without some cancer care. The, the challenges of all this go back to the military hospitals and the system of training uh, that we have put together. Uh, it mirrors the civilian world very well. Uh, it meets civilian standards. It has all the basic residencies in the med sense for the most part, family medicine being the exception where you 
see family programs in standalone places like Pensacola and Bremerton, where you have strong but not training departments in other areas. Because family medicine needs a group of consultations that uh, will both be able to teach and care for patients. So the family medicine hospitals were the Navy's answer for needing more family physicians and not having a good way to have families. I mean, if you think about the National Naval Medical Center, it's a wonderful training center uh, in the beginning of the 21st century. But there are no troop concentrations. I mean, there are a few Marines down at Quantico, uh, but they're not going to have many obstetric cases. They're not going to have all that many pediatric cases. Uh, so family medicine is going to be hard pressed uh, in a place like Bethesda. Even in San Diego, um, you have some challenges. Uh, you've got much better patient population out at 29 Palms uh, for family medicine than you do uh, in San Diego with the fleet. Um, and those kind of challenges lead to some diversity in family medicine. But for the other specialties, their interrelationship in patient care has made the RRCs uh, very leery of standalone surgery residencies, for example, or standalone uh, radiology residencies. Uh, you can make it work, but it takes a lot of creativity and uh, documentation in the teaching, referral, and consultation pieces of the GME pattern. So the easy way to do it was just to make training centers, uh, Tripler, San Diego, uh, Portsmouth, Bethesda um, are the, the large ones. Um, you can do others, but slowly the Navy cut back in Philadelphia and Brooklyn, uh, Charleston, even before they closed some of those hospitals uh, to concentrate their, their talent and uh, the people they needed in a limited number of places. Army did similar but not exactly parallel things. Air Force never had the uh, training infrastructure that the other two services had, partially because they came late and partially because the Air Force doesn't have much of a wounded problem. Um, if the fighters get hurt by the enemy, um, survival is not really uh, very frequent um, so that you don't see that much wounded or sick, uh, particularly as the Air Force increasingly was based in Conus and just flew around the world uh, with uh, mid-air refueling and those kind of things. Uh, they may come to regret that lack of diversity uh, in a peer-peer conflict where we cannot move airframes with uh, impunity, uh, but for right now, the Air Force doesn't have near the need uh, in supporting the deployed forces for subspecialists that the other two services uh, expect to have. Uh, this leads to uh, a lot of redundancy in training centers, um, a lot of challenge in uh, people moving around and uh, being uh, pulled out for deployments and those kind of things, keeping RRCs happy. And it requires the military hospitals to have a significant dependent and retiree component in their, their patient mix. All of which was fine until with TRICARE, uh, we moved the system to a true uh, insurance system. Military Medicare from the 50s up to 65, when they lost the name Medicare to uh, the old folks program and they became uh, the civilian health and medicine uh, program of the Uniformed Services Champus. Uh, those two programs were in part a space A program. So you took the patients you wanted and others, the local providers allowed to go out on the economy. With the coming of TRICARE, you had more of a PPO system 
adopted by the military. Uh, and that meant that once you sent patients out to make space for people in war, you had no easy way to reclaim them. So by the second decade of the 21st century, the cost of graduate medical education in the military was going up as people were uh, sent out. Pediatricians have to go to children's hospital, uh, many of them in Bethesda, not just to downtown, but up to uh, Philadelphia to uh, get the patient mix they need. Uh, the surgeons uh, still need the pediatric cases. Uh, so you're seeing trauma surgeons going to MedStar for extra training. Not for deployment gunshot wound training. That's a special thing we do for surgeons before we deploy them. But for basic graduate medical education, the military hospitals have an increasing challenge. Emergency medicine, uh, we really got only one level one emergency room in the entire military system. And we desperately need uh, emergency medicine providers uh, in the field to uh, help monitor corpsmen and uh, teach uh, TCCC and those kind of things. So you've, you've got big challenges with the TRICARE system uh, moving people out of the military hospitals and then reclaiming that patient population because unlike Champus and the military Medicare, uh, TRICARE is not space A driven. And uh, so what happened was you looked at the problems and the Congress began to look at the hospitals and say, you're all competing for the same cases. It's costing us a lot of money in advertising and all these TRICARE providers, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, uh, Mayo Clinic, others, uh, own at least two senators and a congressman. And uh, they don't want to lose that patient population and those federal checks. So they aren't keen on recovering patients uh, from the TRICARE system to the uh, military system. And so DHA was set up to save money by management centrally uh, to deal with TRICARE on a unified PPO basis and uh, still maintain some level of ability to care for war injured. But in that drawdown, uh, started with BRAC 2005 and then continued with uh, DHA conversion, we are losing expansion beds at the same time we're talking about peer-peer war. And uh, we sometimes forget that the military healthcare system uh, is not primarily a healthcare system, but is primarily a military system. And as long as the GME programs were robust, you had expansion capacity in the beds. We used it in 2005 and six with our um, war on terror, early wounded. And that's when the TRICARE people began to move out of the hospitals. Um, so you've, you've got this, this tension. Medicine cost a lot of money and it cost a lot of money everywhere, but it's particularly visible in the Department of Defense because, well, at one point, the three surgeon generals uh, owned 25% of the commissioned officer corps. And the O10s couldn't understand why the tail was that big in officers. Well, you've got a bunch of educated people in healthcare and they tend to be officers to keep them. But the, the challenge of both the personnel and the I guess in the Obama administration, it was something like $55 billion. Uh, billion dollar bills are noticed even in the Pentagon. So you, you had this combination of issues that came back to the Congress and they are now looking at civilianizing the non-essential uh, military disciplines. Defining non-essential military disciplines every time you've tried to do it has blown up in somebody's face. Pediatrics is the classic case. Uh, early residencies in the late 40s, uh, pediatrics was not in the military portfolio. But all these war brides uh, that were coming home uh, tended to have children. And a couple of kids died in transit on Navy and Army transports for uh, normal childhood 
diseases that were missed by the independent duty corpsmen or stressed GMOs who were trying to take care of everybody, and they died. Well, there are no denominators in pediatrics. A pediatric death is a phenomenal tragedy. It makes the front page of the newspaper. And so both the Army and the Navy had to set up pediatric programs because they were military essential. Um, you couldn't live with the bad press. Well, that's also going to turn out to be true in a lot of areas. And we don't know what's going to blow up next. Uh, and the general accounting, it's not the general accounting office, it's the general accountability office now. Um, they tried to draw a line about what was useful and what was not, and everybody picked holes in it. Uh, nobody can quite decide. It's not that they can't decide, is they don't want to be on the dotted line saying this one's important and that one's not, because that kind of thing comes back and bites you if you're a politician. So we've, we've got this current discussion over how we're going to run a system that was phenomenally stressed in this last year, because we're at an operating in strength to maintain our limited deployments and our hospitals. But if you pull out a field hospital or you staff up the comfort and the mercy and you send it somewhere, uh, those docs aren't going to see patients. And so we had a couple of post camp and station hospitals that uh, lost all their ground uh, taking care of recovering TRICARE into the hospital because they pulled out providers and had to send them somewhere. And there was no convenient backfill uh, because now the hospitals were being managed centrally, but the reserves are on call by the service. And nobody had connected all the dots on how DHA got the Army or the Navy to uh, pull the reservist in to backfill the hospitals on short notice. Well, those kind of things can all be worked out. But in the working out, there's, uh, there's going to be some things like dead kids in the 1940s that are going to uh, scare the politicians and are going to be unfortunate for the people involved. And so I think uh, GME uh, has been stressed. Uh, it's going to continue to be stressed. But at the end of the day, uh, the people that are saying it is essential to maintain a robust learning environment in military medicine are the ones who are right. And uh, I'm hoping that we won't lose too many innocents in, uh, in fighting that fight, because I think it's a, it's a fight that must be fought. Does it mean that every provider in every hospital has to be in uniform? No. But it does mean that our backfill and rotation capacity, as well as our emergency capacity, has to be managed robustly and energetically. And that means a full medical corps reserve, nursing corps reserve for backfill that can be called quickly. In a pandemic, you can't call them up. They're already doing uh, what they were doing. I mean, taking people out of a place that's got COVID to backfill a hospital that's going to go take care of people that have COVID um, is largely self-defeating. And the, the challenge of peer-peer war is I am not sure that there will not be CONUS casualties. And that means pulling people quickly out of the reserve uh, may be problematic if your local power company just blew up or uh, there was a precision strike from space. Uh, some of the things in peer-peer war discussion and doctrine uh, remind me of London in 1943. Um, and your civilian providers become just as important as your military providers in that case. So I think there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done about military GME in light of new strategic doctrine that has not been done. If we were just beginning to make those cases for the humanitarian concerns in uh, GME training. I mean, you need pediatricians, you, uh, 
you need advanced nurse practitioners and PAs to uh, be primary care if you're going to help uh, countries in South America, the Pacific Rim, Africa, uh, develop healthcare systems. Uh, gastroenterology is just important in the civilian world as it is uh, in the United States. Uh, it's not particularly a highly needed military specialty, but it's an important humanitarian issue where diet and nutrition are, uh, are problematic. So you've, you've got a variety of strategic arguments that the end strength needs to be connected up to, and GME is the source of maintaining end strength. So I, I think the GME issues uh, that have been particularly volatile in the last generation uh, need to be tied closely as they have been in the 60s, as they were in the 40s, to the strategic use of the forces uh, deployed and the missions. And I think at the end of the day, that will win the, the case because, again, nobody wants to be tied to that numerator problem of dead children or the inability to take care of the force. Over. That was a wonderful explanation, sir. And being a pediatrician myself and knowing that there are a lot of pediatricians on the line, um, we can all agree with you that none of us want any dead children. So um, any other questions from the group? I have one, but I don't want to take away from someone else. I, um, Jen, I, I have one. This is Captain Zabraki. Um, Hi, sir. Uh, Dr. Dr. Smith, I, I also have great uh, fond memories back at USU listening to your, your lectures. I'll echo what, what uh, Anthony said. I think I remember th this exact same lecture he was talking about as well. <laughs> Greatly appreciate you coming to um, chat with us. Um, kind of on that, that same realm of the GME drawdown, um, uh, you, you know, I... I'm interested to hear your uh, views and opinions on um, the importance of our uh, senior officers and experience with, you know, we have significant time in between conflicts where um, we rely on people that have been there and done that to help to train the the people below us on um, what to expect, you know, the, the unique aspects of um, military medicine, et cetera. And um, there's been a recent shift in um, both um, physician um, pay approaches, as well as the change in uh, retirement benefits, where, um, you know, the, the dedication to a full career in the military was something that was, you know, had an incentive towards the end. Uh, and now as we move towards a blended retirement and we no longer have kind of that 20 year carrot to keep a lot of our uh, senior 05s and 06s in uh, with the pay differential on the outside, kind of see, you know, a lot of our mid-level and junior physicians um, not having a significant incentive to stay in, which potentially leads to a lot of our senior people leaving and um, potentially foresee a military medicine force that um, is significantly younger and less experienced. And then as we get into these peer-to-peer -peer conflicts, um, how do you see that kind of impacting our uh, ability to adapt to and learn from the history of our prior uh, military conflicts and the medicine involved in that. We have gone through times when we did not have gray hair. And we generally got lucky in not having a big enough fight. Um, there, there is a huge fight going on right now over the next year's DOD budget. And anything that adds to those costs uh, is very hard for uh, the administration to be enthusiastic about. But it's absolutely essential that the right mix of personnel 
by grade and experience be retained. And this is, this is something where the Surgeon General's office becomes truly a staff officer. All you can do is carry the word to the one, and the one carries it up to the secretary. Um, and then the politicians make hard decisions. And you come back and you have to make do. Sometimes reserves can be used to retain some of that gray hair. We did that in the, the 70s. Other times you, you lose the gray hair. That happened in the, the 90s. Um, as we go through 20 year cycles, um, this has always been a huge personnel management issue. Um, but you're right, it's absolutely essential. Um, I remember when I first came to USIS back in the 80s, I was teaching once a month uh, neurosurgery rounds on the history of neurosurgery. And they invited me to scrub in a couple of times. And one time I was scrubbing in over what the Army calls Walter Reed Classic. And uh, the chairman of surgery came in and said, look at your tray in five seconds, I'm turning off the power to your saw and your suction. You are in a war zone. And you will need to pick up the giggly saw to finish opening the skull. And then he turned off the power. And the trainee uh, picked up the giggly saw and looked at it kind of funny. And the attending had to show him how to put it into the hole and complete opening the skull. And I asked Jean George about that after the entertainment was over. And he said, I do that episodically to remind them that they may be called upon to act in a foreign environment. We had a Navy anesthesiologist who uh, went out to Madigan on a uh, inter-service assignment to be chief of anesthesiology. And for three months of the year, he did all the active duty cases outside with field anesthesia machines uh, to assure that the residents knew how to use the field anesthesia machine. Um, same argument. The, the importance of being able to do with the equipment you're going to have in a constrained environment requires teaching that the Mayo Clinic and Mass General are not going to give you. And the Navy's got to have people that can do that. The Army's got to have people that can do that. And unless that kind of thing is done, uh, the current discussions about uh, field care of uh, longer periods of time uh, simply become a euphemism for diet of wounds. Um, the diet of wounds rate is invariably going to go up in peer peer war, and we need to be honest with the American people about that. But there's no need to drive it up any higher than it has to be. And you see that in every war. The diet of wounds rate goes down every year in World War II as people gain experience. It goes down in Vietnam, even with the doctor draft, because we had a few regulars, many of them in reserves in the specialties coming in. The challenge is that in a peer-peer war, uh, time may be compressed and we may not have years to get people up to speed. And we need to make the case that there are certain skills that only experience can teach. And you can only do it in a controlled military environment where the seniors are comfortable with that kind of teaching. Because with the changes in ferries for two years ago, uh, I'm not sure any JAG officer is going to permit you to use a field anesthesia machine on an active duty patient anymore. But there are cases where it would be perfectly safe and meet the appropriate standards of care. But you need the experience to know which those cases are. And if you're a deployed anesthesiologist, you still need to know how to use the field anesthesia machine. And if you're a deployed neurosurgeon, you better know how to use a giggly saw if you've got a limited power source. 
critical care, other areas, we need to think about uh, our technology and what the workarounds are. And the people that have been there and done that are the only ones who can teach it safely. So I would, I would argue that there is a, a huge need to make the case for finding ways to keep the gray hair in training. It may be the one useful place for civilians in the DHA hospitals is uh, get somebody to retire and then pay them to come back uh, and let them double dip like everybody does in the VA and uh, retain the gray hair that way to teach. I know uh, Captain Butler, uh, TC3 work, uh, after he retired, went back to Pensacola doing uh, ophthalmology uh, and so is able to continue to, to honcho the C3 committee uh, as a contract uh, or civilian employee of the Navy um, practicing medicine, but uh, bringing his understanding of field care uh, online and helping teach and reform it uh, through the joint trauma system uh, as a civilian uh, after a career. So there, we're going to have to think creatively, but uh, the gray hair in training is going to be central if we have military-based GME. If we don't have military-based GME, we wouldn't have a hard time having military medicine in the first year of war over. Thank you so much, sir. That was fantastic. Um, any other questions from the group? I'm happy to ask my question, but once again, I don't want to take it away from anyone else. All right, well, then I'll ask mine. Um, sir, uh, you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier um, just about how kind of strained military medicine has become during, over this last year with COVID. I was curious, um, during the last global pandemic that occurred um, a little over 100 years ago, um, was military medicine at all involved in that? And uh, was there anything that was kind of learned um, from, from that uh, event that could have been applied to this pandemic? I, I must correct you. The last global pandemic um, was probably in the 1960s with the Hong Kong flu. Uh, millions of people very, died worldwide. Very true, sir. Sorry. Um, the, we, we focus on 1918 because that's the one that's been the most written about. It's the one PBS knows about and uh, those kind of things. And it's the wrong model because the, the medicine was so different. And if you remember your general history, um, 1918, uh, many countries were involved in a serious political discussion that we call World War I. And that monopolized most of the military medicine. It monopolized a lot of things. And may have been in part the, the source of much of the pandemic's spread by moving troops around uh, in the same way that uh, 67 uh, was exacerbated in the United States by people coming home from Vietnam. Uh, we brought people home by airplane and they went home to their uh, home of residence uh, after their deployment was over. And we scattered flu around the country in uh, a way that made it much worse here than in Europe. So military activity uh, needs to be thought about carefully. And this time uh, to give full marks to uh, all three surgeons general, they, uh, they briefed the line on the need for uh, force health protection issues. And uh, it led to a certain amount of chaos on local force health protection rules being varied all over the country, but it kept cases down most places, the uh, the TR and the Hill being two notable Navy exceptions, but uh, for the most part, uh, nobody lost any operational uh, capability and nobody spread the disease from the military to the civilian world. And those were two huge wins for military medicine in this pandemic. I think the military in pandemic is mostly going to be a DISCA issue. That's what it was this time. It's what it'll be next time. 
The problem is the military is neither funded nor staffed for DISCA. Uh, we don't know the various state laws well. We don't know the regulations. We don't know the supply systems. We don't know the reporting systems. So when you take a field hospital or a hospital ship and you plop it down in New York, it doesn't fit into the system well, and we don't have the civil action officers that are trained to work in the United States. Our, our civic action people are trained to work OCONUS, where they're working with civilian affairs in the local command. Well, there's not a local command doing humanitarian work in New York. Uh, you've simply sent medical assets. So one of the things that I think will come out of the MHS lessons learned is that if Congress wants to use the military as a force in being, um, which they pretty much have to do because it's the only resource they've got, um, then they need to provide some assets for it. And they need to clear up some of the regulations and rules around it. I mean, the military had PPE in warehouses uh, when the world was crying for PPE, but the law didn't let you uh, move it uh, from military warehouses because it was bought with money for military medicine to put on either gate guards at the, the base or to give to the local civilian hospital that was out of stuff. Um, those laws can be changed, but the training for DISCA activities, uh, that detracts from other training and education uh, and from readiness uh, because it's not what you have a military medicine for. Nobody thought about this problem when they shut the PHS down in the 80s. All those PHS hospitals were staffed with deployable officers who were designed to be used in CONUS in a time of emergency. But when you close the hospital, they lost their day jobs. And so that force in being disappeared. And so whether it's a hurricane or an epidemic or uh, Cuban refugees being brought to uh, Fort Sill, um, the military is the only people that you've got to provide that care, deployed to the border to take care of uh, immigrants last year. Um, the, the challenge with that is there's no training or doctrine for those kind of activities. Uh, I think the lessons learned from this activity will, uh, will cause some doctrine to be developed, but whether in strength, money and training will go to put flesh on those doctrinal bones uh, remains to be seen because we go back to uh, there's a lot of expenses that the country wants to take on and defense is not high on the, the current list and defense medicine will uh, be part of that hard year for defense. Um, so there's some there's some issues uh, and again this can be taught informally like Colonel George turning off the power and the giggly saw if you've done it. But if you haven't done it, then all you can do is read about it. And that that's not real. And so again, people that have been there and done that need to be in the training programs. And uh, that's, that's, I think, long-term essential to the preservation of military medicine. Over. Thank you so much, sir, for explaining that and for correcting me um, when it comes to the history of pandemics in the world. Um, appreciate that. Um, if only you could go uh, in front of Congress and explain the need for GME in military medicine, I think that would be very helpful. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? There's really just a couple more minutes left. Um, if anyone has a, a last minute question, uh, please either raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Um, and feel free to ask or any comments also, if anyone has just any comments. No? I, I, I know I already maybe used my one question, but, um, I, and maybe there's not enough time for this, but sir, as we, as we move into uh, an anticipated sea battle as our next conflict, the military medicine that we've been practicing for this past decade or so is going to be significantly different. I was wondering if you had in your um, extensive knowledge of the historical aspects of what we previously did, any insights into how we can best provide our military medicine care in that new 
war environment, at least new for us, our semi gray hair people out here. The last time we had a sea battle was 1945. Nobody's got that much gray hair. The, uh, at that time, we had hospital ships with the oilers behind the fleet, and they could come forward, and you could move from roll one to roll three or four uh, by moving people on a Stokes from one ship to the other. We don't have that capacity anymore, and we're going to have to use the Marines uh, casually receiving ships uh, to take casualties off uh, the gray hulls uh, to free up uh, care. I mean, if you actually take an Exocet missile into a carrier, you're going to have more injured people than you can take care of on that carrier. Um, and the carrier needs to get its flight deck back online and continue the fight. And so evacuating those people is going to be important and the Air Force is not going to be able to do it for you. Um, and the Navy doesn't have anything that has the legs to do uh, the Western Pacific back to anywhere safe. So it's gonna, we're gonna have to do some, some at sea hospital thinking uh, that we haven't done since 1945 if we really get into a peer peer sea battle. Um, it's, uh, it's a different kind of world. I mean, the last time we took serious casualties was the Stark in the 90s. And we found the IDC had to spend most of his time on the one senior chief who had to be kept conscious but pain free so that he could tend the pump that was keeping the Stark afloat. The other people just got buddy care because if you lose the ship, you lose everybody. And Navy medicine uh, at sea, as opposed to taking care of Marines, which is where most of the casualties have been since the Second World War, uh, Navy medicine at sea is a very different kind of medicine, and it requires planning and practice. We're doing a little bit of that on some of the casualty receiving ships, probably as much as we've got training money to do, but we're going to need more, and we're going to need to make some mistakes in practice so we don't make the mistakes in war. Uh, but you're right. It's going to be different than anything anybody's ever done that's in uniform today. Over. Thank you so much, sir. And um, that was a great closing question, Kevin Zabraki. Thank you. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Smith, for being here and for joining us, um, especially for your last lecture. Um, it was absolutely phenomenal. And I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to answer some of our questions and have this really great discussion today. Um, thank you so much. Congratulations on retirement. And um, I'll just open the floor. Anyone that wants to say anything, please feel free. Um, but otherwise, thank you all for coming to uh, today's meeting. Thank you. I'll say happy birthday to the Navy Medical Corps. <laughs> Y'all have a good day. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Very much appreciated. Commander, thanks for putting this on. I appreciate your time. Of course, thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate your time.